Good evening. I'm Kamala Gnuadana, for those who don't know me. Uh, I'm the civil engineering section of Kamala Chavan for this session after hospitalizing us last year. Uh, I welcome you for this physical event mainly. We are doing this on the wall. Can you hear me? Okay. Actually, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you for this physical event, which is uh, we are doing on Zoom, but it's not hybrid. So we welcome everyone here participating in this event. First of all, actually, I welcome our Professor Dishan Jai Singha, who has taken this challenge. Actually, this year, I think this is the 17th lecture for the session. And even the previous year, you did 21 lectures under these highways, uh, tall buildings. So this is under highway bridges. Actually, this lecture series on structural design of highway bridges. And this is a winding up session. And you will be explaining what they have, what you have taught earlier. And you will be explaining this uh, recent advance in bridge design technology with Eurocode criteria. So, Professor, actually, as I said, I will really, really appreciate your commitment and your time taken, your leisure time you used to. So, this is all benefit of our members. And I think we are much, uh, we are, we have, we are much uh, grateful to you for that. With this welcome address, I would say, and I welcome you for the session. Uh, this uh, physical meeting we arranged definitely to felicitate, and we wanted to say a big thank you. So that's why we organized this because we couldn't do it last year. So this is what our main aim was to do this. Uh, the last lecture as a physical one. So uh, I also welcome our next resource person, Engineer Malik Mendis. Where are you? Ah, oh, yeah. I welcome you for the for this uh, lecture. And actually, it will be some uh, something like some excitement to you because you are going to talk to our audience here. We are expecting more audience, but. So it will be a great opportunity and uh, we welcome you for the event. Uh, I welcome Madam Chinta Jai Singha. Actually, it's a great privilege for us, especially accepted by invitation and you are here with your husband's lecture. So maybe that is not an unusual thing, but thank you very much and welcome you for this. <laughs> Uh, actually, we are starting today's event right now, and it is an honor for me to do this uh, instigating not about our veteran professor, Jai Singh. I will not talk anything what you earn, what you gain, but just briefly as a formality, uh, you, are, you are a professor, you are the professor, senior professor of civil engineering at the University of Moratua. Uh, today, you will discuss recent advances in bridge design technology with your accords uh, criteria. And today, you will do a Q&A session of what you taught in the previous lectures under structural design of highways, bridge, highway bridges. Our second resource person, uh, Engineer Malik, uh, you are not a stranger, but not exposed to us occasionally so uh, I'll just brief you some, some something about uh, engineer Malik he's also graduated from the University of Moroto in 2004 he was a structural design engineer at Stripe Consultants and then at Sierra Company for eight years uh, presently he's a director of Nestec engineering he has excelled his design knowledge locally and internationally and he's equally competent to design bridges as well uh, as tall buildings. I think this here is a teacher people combination, I suppose. Maybe you have studied from him during the university. So it's a nice uh, showcase for others as well. With these introductions, without further ado, I would like to hand over. But before that, I just have a small reminder because you all know annually we are having an election in the ISL. 
So many of our members who worked hard for this to get up this uh, take this uh, civil intersectional committee to uh, some standard. Maybe several of our members will compete for those. Whatever it is, my request is just if you get the chance to vote, please do so because our people are very lazy to vote. So that's the main main message I want to give you. And if you feel that our people who work here are eligible or good enough, so consider them as well, right? With that message, uh, I I think without further ado, I hand over the stage to Professor Jai Singer and Engineer Mali. Over to you, Professor and Mali. Thank you. Thank you, Idinia Kamala, uh, Chairman of the Civil Engineering Sectional Committee for Session 22. 20. So this is the last lecture of our series, and uh, I was told this is the 17th lecture of the series that we organized on uh, design of highway bridges, especially uh, concentrating on Europods. So, so the, for the concluding uh, lecture, we selected the title, Recent Advances in Bridge Design Technology with Eurocodes Criteria. And uh, this is a question and answer session. So if you want to ask anything, you can uh, stop and ask, ask the questions. And uh, so I'm from Department of Civil Engineering, University of Moratua. And if you want to get uh, more information about me, just type MTR Jaising on web and you can get all the information. And also a long list of publications that we have done. Uh, and many of them are readily downloadable on uh, the web. So first an overview of the presentation, I'll give a brief introduction. And uh, loads acting on bridges as for Eurocodes, and uh, how we do the analysis with Grilesh modeling. Because in the uh, latter part, uh, Engineer Malit will show you how to do more advanced modeling on MIDAS Gen, MIDAS Civil. MIDAS Civil is the right case. And uh, word about MIDAS, you know, all the students, uh, undergraduates, postgraduates of University of Moratua Faculty of Engineering are eligible for a, a proper copy of sorry. web based license of midas gen civil gtx soilworks nfx fea cfd there is a huge number of software and they are all uh, eligible to have a license on their laptop. So we actually use a lot of uh, MIDAS, MIDAS family software for our teaching. And then uh, a very st strong statement by a uh, veteran bridge engineer ranked one of the best in England. And he came for a lecture in 1990 at Cambridge University and he made a very strong statement that is very useful when you have that kind of uh, ideas with you, it's very easy to perform structural designs. And the main steps in bridge design and the use of stronger materials with Eurocode. So that is the main theme that I want to address, but uh, most of the earlier information would be background information. And the benefit benefits with allowable stress limits. So that is with stronger limits, stronger materials we get a bigger range for stressors. And with pre-stress concrete, you can optimize a lot because the stress range is small. And importance of control in the crack widths and how to do it. And some applications in Sri Lanka with Eurocodes and conclusions. So first we'll uh, look at what happened 
mid 1980s uh, road development authority started using bs 5400 1970 which is having 10 parts and uh, we used uh, most of the time we used bs uh, 5400 part 2 loading system which consists of a certain a certain type of loading but later somewhere around uh, in the last few uh, around last uh, 10 years probably we used 2006 loads which are much higher than 1978 loads but uh, now again rd has uh, gone to for euro port loading and we can see what's meant by those loading and then uh, but uh, so british standard institutes stopped updating their bs codes in 2010 and now they pro promote bs en which means that is the english version of euro code and you can have a german version you know you can have different versions but it's only the language different equations are the same and then you can have a national and extra whenever you want to vary so when uh, engineer chandrasiri himal chandrasiri was the acting director general in 2015 he initiated the move change over to euro codes and when uh, after that engineer rohit sarna became the director general and then uh, during his time, the first structured training program was given to Road Development Authority engineers, and uh, it was all conducted by Peradeniya University, Department of Civil Engineering. And uh, at the moment, RDA accepts only Euro codes. They do not accept designs based on VS codes because they are not no longer. Uh, valid, so they have been stopped. They have stopped publishing, and uh, so it's a good move that you know Road Development Authority on their own has gone for Euro codes because Euro codes allow us to do much more economical designs, but having a greater strength. Strength is more, cost is less. So it's a good thing and also durability also more. So it's a good move. So first, loads. Bridges are subjected to moving loads, but we design them for static loads. Although they are moving, we consider them as static loads when you are performing the analysis. The reason is the natural frequency of vibration of bridges would be much lower than the time period taken for change in loads. So if the bridge responds faster than the loading variation, then it's a quasi static loading. So we consider them as static loads. So in uh, earlier case, we had uh, type A and type B loading. Type A consisted of, consisted of UDL and a knife edge load. Knife edge load was to represent the axle, heavy axles, and uh, UDL represented 24 ton trucks, one after the other. So that's how they got the loading. 24 ton trucks of about six meter length, bumper to bumper. So it's one after the other. And that is the load that is that we considered as 30 kilonewtons per meter per lane. That's how it came. But uh, when the loading length is longer, you can go for reduced loads. An eye flow load is, uh, can be applied in any direction. It can be along or across. Generally, we apply it across. And type B loading is the very heavy loading. And uh, in uh, HB loading, you can design for 25 units, 30 units, and 45 units. So RDA adopted 30 units. But if you look at a country like England, they have adopted 45 units. And there's one bridge in Sri Lanka that was designed for 45 units deliberately because that is uh, the Orgodotta flyover. 
and it is a place where you get huge amount of container traffic directly from the port. So because of that reason, we designed that particular flyover for 45 units of HB because it's frequently used by very heavy lorries. And uh, in the audience, we have engineer Mangala and he did all the drafting of that particular bridge in 2006. And uh, so, so we have all these loads, uh, H, sorry, one unit of HB is uh, one ton per axle per, and uh, there are four axles. So if you have 30 units of HB, the, this should be HB, not HJ. 30 units of HB means one unit is four tons in four axles. So altogether, one ton per axle, one unit means four tons, 30 units means 120 ton. 120 ton vehicle having a total length of about less than 10 meters. Over less than 10 meters, we consider a total weight of 120 tons. And if you look at the type of vehicles we use, one of the heaviest uh, lorries is uh, 10 ton, Ashok Leyland, 10 wheeler, that can carry 600 bags of cement. So 600 bags of cement is 30 tons. 30 tons plus uh, 10 is 40. So we have a about a 12 meter long lorry weighing 40 tons, whereas we design for a lorry or a truck having a length of 10 meters, 120 tons. So you can see if we properly design a bridge, it would be a very safe structure. It would be a very safe structure. So 45 units represent 180 tons. So it's a huge load. So if you properly do, do a design, there's very slim chance for a bridge to collapse. So this is the early 1978 loading. And here you can see up to 30 meters, 30 kilonewtons per meter. And how you get that 30 kilonewtons is by having 24 ton trucks bumper to bumper. Now this is HB vehicle having a total width of 3.5 meters, four axles. Each axle has, a, has one ton per unit. So four axles, four tons. 30 units, 120 tons. And you can see the length is variable and it can, the lowest length is six meters between these two axles. The maximum spacing is 26 meters between these two axles. The reason for stretching the vehicle is to ensure that we can keep two axles on one span, two axles on the other span, especially when we are doing continuous bridges. On the other hand, why we can, we have six meters is we can keep the whole truck, whole truck within one span. So, and, okay. So the total vehicle, the vehicle has a total weight of 120 tons. And this is a 2006, and you can see that ceiling on 30, 30 meters, 30 kilonewtons per meter has been removed. And this is a huge load much higher than 1978 loading that they adopted in 2006 in England to cater for the fact that uh, they have channel that is the rail link between Europe and England so that they started getting heavier trucks to England. So to allow for that, they went for this particular loading in 2006. And this is a huge load. But when you look at European loading, now you can see there's a similarity. Now, European loading, they say you have to design one lane for nine kilonewtons per meter square. But if you look at uh, a lane width of 3.5, 1978 loading of 30 kilonewtons per meter per lane, 30 divided by 3.5 also comes to about 8.3. And here you can see Euro code request, uh, you know, specify nine kilonewtons per meter squared. So it's on meter squared basis. Whereas uh, uh, BS5400 loading was 30 kilonewtons per meter per lane. So when you divide it by 30 by lane width of 3.5, you will end up with 8.3 or something. 
So basically, you can see these loads have not changed much. They are the same. And then the adjacent lanes, you can go for 2.5, but you have to have this tandem loading. And uh, here you can see the arrangement and uh, this loading, the magnitudes are given here. 300 kilonewtons per axle, 600 kilonewtons on this. Means 60 tons in the middle of the bridge. So you can see, again, they are very heavy loads. So we are designing for very heavy loads. And uh, these two options are also given sometimes we want to see, especially in cantilevers and so on, we want to see what is the effect of a vehicle going on the cantilever. Sometimes these point loads can be very useful. And then, uh, you know, you have to get the abnormal loading and uh, Eurocode abnormal loading can vary between 600 kilonewtons to 3,600 kilonewtons. And you might ask, what is the, what's the value that uh, Road Development Authority of Sri Lanka recommends? And you, if you look at historically, we have used 30 units of HB, and that comes to 120 tons or 1,200 kilonewtons. So now, Road Development Authority uh, recommends abnormal vehicle of 120, uh, 1,200 kilonewtons. It's abnormal vehicle of 1,200 kilonewtons, but uh, you know you can see it's uh, spread over a reasonable length. Then we can see how we, if we have the loading, the next thing that comes to our mind is how are we going to do the analysis? So I'm sure what I'm showing is a grillage analysis, which is the simplest analysis that you can do. But uh, when engineer Malit presents, he will show you how to do a little more complicated modeling. And uh, so when you want to get a UDL, you can have this way, or when you want to get a point load, and again, the point load for maximum shear, and here you can see the vehicle has been placed. Four axles have been placed, uh, two axles have been placed very close to the support. Whereas this one, when you want to take at the maximum moment, we place the vehicle in the middle of the bridge. So, and then you will end up with bending moments, shear forces, and torsional moments. So once you get all these uh, answers, we have the basic data needed for performing a structural design. So in the case of structural design, we have to make sure that we have a bending moment, shear force, torsional moment. So when you have all those numbers, then it's a designer's job. Until you get the numbers, you know, you don't have sufficient data to perform a structural design. Right, so now this is a very important statement by a very experienced engineer. Uh, it says, uh, what, uh, so this is what uh, uh, engineer Robert Benham said when uh, he was uh, conducting an advanced course for the industry at University of Cambridge in 1990. Concrete bridges designed to our codes of practice are at no risk of failure due to longitudinal actions under the specified traffic loading. Now you can see why he says that. Because we are designing for huge loads which are unlikely to occur in the lifespan of the bridge. So because of that reason, he says the search for excessive accuracy in the calculation of transverse distribution of moments due to live loads, for instance, it's a waste of time. What he says is, do a reasonable analysis, get a reasonable answer. Don't try to, you know, go deep into theories and try to get extremely accurate answers because to start with, the loads that we use are imaginary loads. They are not actual loads. And we have a huge margin in the loads that we are using. It is far more profitable to think carefully about the stresses that can arise in cast in situ bridge deck during construction, due to temporary conditions, high initial pre-stress, 
settlement of foundations, and above all, heat of hydration. And heat of hydration is, a, is extremely important because we learned a lesson in the hard way with our STDP project, Southern Transport Development Project from Kuruduga uh, Hatabma to Matara. Uh, not much attention has been paid in the bridges, bridge foundation, especially the pile caps. And the temperature has gone above 70 degrees and we had severe catching in the in those pile caps due to delayed ettringite formation. So heat of hydration is a very important topic and I have in the lecture series, I have shown how that can be handled. So in the steps in the design, the premium stage that the designer get most of the important parameters like the number of spans, length of individual spans, the alignment, et cetera, sorted out. Then uh, Professor T. Meyerberg, former president of Institution of Structural Engineers, London, uh, named this part as fun part of the design. So what he says is, this is the real challenge. Getting the preliminary design correct or spot on is the real challenge to the designers and that's a real, real engineering part of the design, not the detailed design. Because once you write a spreadsheet, if you have parameters there, you any computer will do the detailed design, but computer can't do a preliminary design where you come up with a good solution. A detailed design stage where the design engineer will do all the calculations with the design standards and specifications it is very important to obtain good solutions at the preliminary design stage. And that's where your deep knowledge is needed. Development of good preliminary solutions need an in-depth knowledge. That's the type of knowledge we try to give during the lecture series we had. And we discussed a lot of practical applications and how to deal with situations. And today also we are going to go a little deeper into it with respect to the Eurocode based uh, advantages for sure. Right. Now, uh, when you are, uh, if you want to become a bridge engineer, it's not a very difficult task because there are standard solutions. Now, this is the standard Y beam. And if you want to know what is the section you need, you have a bridge of 25 meter span. So you go here, go this way, Y5. So Wi-Fi is here. You have the, all the details. You go here. Wi-Fi is here. That's what you have to select. So what you don't know is the pre-stress, but you know the section. So within a few hours, you can become a bridge. You know, you can design, a, become a bridge engineer by looking at these standard solutions, right? And then if you are keeping one meter or two meter center centers, you can have different solutions because both, uh, both those are covered here. Two meter spacing and one meter spacing, both are covered in the standard chart. But uh, that is not uh, the type of situations that we are going to discuss today. What we are going to discuss is this type of situations. No standard beam. You have to come up with the solution. And that's where the primary designs that you perform at the beginning, beginning and uh, where you select the strength of concrete, the, the structure, the section shape, what the type of connectivity, continuity, all those things can deeply affect the final outcome and the cost. So that's where you have to be careful. And here you can see the cross section that uh, engineer Mangal has drawn. Uh, yeah, about uh, how many, 18 years ago? Yes, around 16 years ago, he has drawn these sections. And then uh, at the side, these were converted to the real beams and concreted, stressed. Uh, the tendons, extra length tendons were removed and finally ready for uh, end end uh, treatment. And then you have the beams on ground, 
then you have to lift them up. Now you can see where the Euro code comes in. You can see these beams can be, when we designed again, we went for 45 megapascal concrete. And uh, even with 45 megapascal concrete, one of these beams had a weight of around 130 tons. You lift it. But if you go and bring it down to 100 tons, on one side you are saving the material, on the other side, easier to launch. And because it's low weight, you can go for a longer span. That's also possible. And, and deeper, uh, high strength materials allow you to have a lesser depth. And you can see very serious situations you have to analyze. Why? Here you can see some of these beams are on one side and nothing on the other side. So this uh, substructure should be analyzed for all these different scenarios. And then uh, these are other situation where you are bringing the beams and lifting. And then, uh, you know, engineers become happy because now they can walk on it. Then they do the top slab. Right. And then finally, you will end up with a solution like this. And here you can see uh, something, some special wedge type thing. And uh, I'll explain it in a moment. So all this time, we were concentrating on the deck. But deck cannot come unless we have a substructure and the foundation. So we'll have a brief look at substructure and the foundation. And these are the finished product. No expansion joints can be seen. There's one expansion joint at the beginning, one at the end. Length between two expansion joints is 330 meters. 330 meters or 11 spans. 11 spans of 30 meters. And these are the pile foundations, piling, and then uh, four piles, and then the pier, and then comes the special trick. This is the first time that force tensioning has been used in a pier capping beam in Sri Lanka. And we had 5.5 meter long cantilevers from here to there. Long cantilevers, 5.5 meters long. And again, uh, you know, although I did the design uh, with special permission, engineer Nimal Chandrasiri also participated actively. And later he, he became the director general, acting director general in 2015. And he's the man who initiated this uh, action on uh, moving for Euro codes as well. And here you can see big uh, shear, lot of shear links and torsion. Torsional links are there, shear links are there. You have to be very, very careful with shear links and torsional links. Shear link, we, we, we come read the link at one node, whereas in the case of torsional link, we take it right round. And uh, so there, you have to just keep in mind that there's a difference between a torsional link and shear link. And here you can see, this will be subject to a lot of torsion because we may have to keep beams on one side before we keep the beams on the other side. The moment we have beams on both sides, no torsion. But the moment we have the beam only on one side during construction, there will be a huge amount of torsion on the pier capping beam. So that has to be looked after. But fortunately, once you go for post tensioning, there's a huge torsional and shear capacity. There's an enhancement in the shear capacity the moment you go for post tensioning. And here you can see the arrangement. And here you can see the problem. The beams are only on one side and on the other side, nothing. And so you can have torsion, bending, all kinds of forces on a pier capping beam during construction and you have to very carefully handle it. And uh, not only that, if you look at these, uh, these ones here, you can see uh, there are some ducts that are curved and there are some ducts going straight. So what we did was we stressed only the straight ducts initially, because we did not have enough weight to counteract the pre-stressing effect. So we did 
we counteracted only the weight of the beams initially. Then we completed the deck. For the live loads, we had the curved tendons. So when we did the tensioning, we had a very slight crack appearing here. And the moment we play, started placing the beams, it, it closed. So we uh, fortunately, RD engineers did not see it. Otherwise, they would have panicked a lot. When they see a crack at the, here, fortunately, they did not see it. Also, we also didn't bother to highlight it. So we did analysis and we found that there's nothing to worry. So we just placed the beams. And the moment the beams were placed, all the cracks were closed. So uh, this is what you get. And then finally, you can see the product. The spear is here, beam is here. Huge moments due to live loads, not due to red loads. Red loads is all balanced. After the construction, it's all balanced. But live loads, you can have container trucks on the edge stopped due to some problem at the end of the bridge. And uh, so you can get huge uh, unbalanced moments. So those have to be looked after when you are doing the design. And sometimes, you know, in this type of situation, we actually apply pre-stress vertical. You can apply pre-stress vertically as well, right? That's another trick available to give the stability. And then you have to look, up the, look after the abutments, these reinforced earth uh, access roads, and uh, you can see reinforced earth construction. And then another important point is, how do you get rid of expansion joints? I said no expansion joints can be seen. So there are so many different solutions and uh, engineer Malit will talk uh, about one of the solutions he has adopted. And in this particular case, we did not go for continuity, we actually, Pass the slab continuous, but then later we we created a groove, but we had a doubles uh, on one side into the concrete, other side wrapped with polythene, so that so that there's space for movement, minor movements, but no separation, and then you can uh, fill the fill the cut with polysulfide, and then place a your textile and do the carpeting, then you don't see a joint. And in Sri Lanka, we have done a recent study and our finding is basically our temperature variations are too small to have expansion joints in concrete bridges, not in steel bridges. Steel bridges need it, but concrete bridges, concrete is strong enough to take most of the stressors caused by temperature variation. So we don't need any expansion joints we can simply cast the beams continuous and nothing will happen in the in our bridges. And actually, road development authority engineers have realized it. So if you go to Panadura Bridge, now they have carpeted the whole thing, right? So, so no expansion noise earlier. There was a huge jerk, and it was bad for the bridge as well because you are you are you don't have a flat surface, and you are all these heavy buses will jump from one bridge to the other. And it can create vibration. So now it's all smooth, nice ride, and it's far better than the earlier situation. And here you get this type of joint. You can't see the real joint. And uh, now the main thrust of your today's lecture, and that is the use of stronger materials, euro codes. And here you can see we have been using 30, now 30 means cylinder, 37 means cube. And we have been using 35, 45, uh, 30, 40, that range, 30, 40. Here you get, uh, so 30, 40, 30, 37, that type of range. So we have been using 37 cube strength, 45 cube strength, 30 cube strength. If you look at Paduela uh, Beach, post tension, 30 megapascal. Now, recently Mali did, uh, Slave Island flyover, 60 megapascal. 55, 67, yeah. So, so in this range, 50 to 60 range. And actually he has gone for 55 to 67, right? So you can see 35 years ago, or 40 years ago, 
30 megapascal for post tensioning and 40 megapascal for pre tension. Today, 67 megapascal for post tension, more than doubled. Right? And then the important question is how do you get that kind of high strength concrete? And we have covered that in great detail. We have to keep only one thing in mind. For concrete, cement is the friend, water is the enemy. So you minimize the water content to around 120 to 130 per meter cube. You can easily hit these targets. These are all achievable the moment you go for uh, extra strong super plus sizes. We call them high grade super plus sizes. And high grade super plus sizes will allow you to hit water cement ratio, water contents per meter cube as low as 120 to 130 kilograms. The moment you do that, you can get super high strong, uh, super, super strong concrete, and uh, even 67 in, uh, and even 80. And for highway bridges, the maximum allowed is 70, 85. But in buildings, what is maximum allowed is 90, 105. In buildings, you can go up to 90, 105. Whereas in bridges, what is allowed is 70, 85. 85 is cube strength of 85. Cube strength of 85 means how many tons on the testing machine? 200 tons. And you will find most of the testing machines available in Sri Lanka are 200 tons, maximum capacity. So, the, so sometimes you have to actually cast 100 millimeter cubes than 150 millimeter cubes when you go for this kind of very high strength complex. Because we don't have testing machine to test the cube, right? So, so basically huge change in the concrete strength. Concrete technology has changed in a big way. And we are fortunate that most of the highest quality uh, admixtures are manufactured in Sri Lanka by a company, Sri Lankan company. So, so we don't have no restriction with concrete strength in Sri Lanka. You, if you want for a building, you can easily go up to 105 cube strength. And for bridges, you can easily go up to 85 cube strength. And these are achievable at site. So, but you have to do site mixing, not, not ready mix plant. So if you want to go for this kind of very high strength, the moment you mix concrete, you have to place it. You can't keep it in the truck mixer for four hours and achieve 85. That's not possible. So you have to do side mixing, not batching plant. When you go for extremely high strength concrete, you have to have either batching plant at the site. So one way or the other, you have to make sure that uh, batching is done at the site and the concrete is placed immediately after mixing. You can't keep four to five hours and then achieve this kind of high strength. That's not possible. Then uh, steel strands, not much change. You can see 1,860. The number, magic number is still there. Not much change. But you don't need a change because the moment you reduce the section size, the moment you reduce the section size, what happens is uh, the... No, it's okay. I think they can see it. No problem. No, they want it here. Yeah, that's okay. So basically, when in pre stress concrete, you use a minimum section, you get the maximum pre stress. So we don't need stronger steel, but what we need is reducing the section size. Okay, now the stressors. Eurocode allow us to go for a maximum stress of 0.6 times cube strength. And if you look at this chart, you can see. Cube strength is always lower than the, the cylinder strength is lower than the cube strength. So when we are using cube strength, the maximum stress was 0.4 times cube strength. Now here you can see we are allowed to go up to 0.6 times cylinder strength. So that means we are allowed a higher range for variable loads, whereas for the permanent loads, what is allowed is 0.45 times the cube strength, the cylinder strength, right? So we have, we can have two additional equations representing the uh, service condition. 
Service condition means total dead load plus about 30% or 60% of fly load, not the maximum load. And 0.6 FCK is used with the maximum load. And uh, with 30 to 60% live load, we use 0.45 FC, FCK. And uh, tension has to be dealt separately. And so for tension, track width is important. And here you can see the, the we generally rely on FCTM mean tensile strength for crack controlling. So in uh, class two structures, we allowed uh, for post tensioning 0 0.36 square root of FCU, which came to about 2.5, 2.8 Newtons per milliliter squared. And here you can see, we are again allowing a similar range in this one also. But if you want to, if you want to think about crack width, then you can go for slightly higher stress when you are doing the calculation. When you go with these ones, you might get a structure where cracks cannot be seen easily. Cracks are almost closed. Whereas if you go for slightly higher stress range, for further optimization, then you have to perform a crack width calculation. Once you, uh, in, in the, at the detailed design stage, you have to do a crack width calculation, but at the preliminary design stage, we have a guideline. So we can have a guideline at the preliminary design stage because the moment you get a good solution at the preliminary design stage, we can always uh, do the detailed calculations and we can actually calculate the track width as well. If you like to get yourself familiar with Eurocode track width calculation, I would recommend uh, referring a book by Moosley and Bungie. So this is, a, this is a very good book with a lot of good examples. So you can uh, look at a book like uh, Reinforced Concrete Design by Moosley and Banshee. Very good book. And, uh, and you can also look at Reynolds Handbook uh, to become familiar with track width calculations for Eurocore. Reynolds Handbook, new version, also has track width calculations. So applications in Sri Lanka, majority of express have been uh, designed for VS5400, including uh, uh, phase uh, one of uh, uh, Central Expressway is also Euro uh, uh, BS mode. Is that right, man? Yeah, yeah it's BS. But uh, Slave Island flyover, uh, Mari said now 55 and 67, right? Okay. So I thought it's 50, 60. And, uh, but it is for Euro courts because uh, it, has to, it had to be a, there was a severe restriction on the depth of the structure. So they had to go for high strength continuous structure. And uh, so Malit will explain more about it. My Elon one was, I was, uh, you know, Malit asked me to do a review. So, and uh, so basically this is uh, Marga did the construction. And uh, so, uh, so they use, uh, they use a uh, hydraulic system for launching. And more advanced than the Chinese, what Chinese contractor used in 2007, eight era. So these 2020, 21 type. So it was a little different. Conclusions, adoption of Eurocodes by Road Development Authority will allow harnessing many benefits of advances in concrete technology for bridges by using up to C7085 concrete for highway bridges. That's a very important statement because uh, today we have the technology, concrete technology to go up to anything close to 100 megapascal cube strength or 90 megapascal cylinder strength. That is all practically possible. And then the methodology for achieving high strength concrete has been covered in great detail in our Civil Engineering Sectional Committee lecture series. So we, we, we have discussed it. And therefore, the technology needed for achieve adoption of Euro codes for cost-effective highway bridges is readily available in Sri Lanka. And so we must go for harnessing that because uh, in the future, we cannot afford to go for expensive designs. Our designs must be as cost-effective as possible. And Euro code allow us to achieve that goal. So with that, I will conclude. And... Uh, 
and uh, I will hand over it to uh, Ejiria Malit uh, because he's going to show the real applications with Eurocodes. And I have to do an acknowledgement. Professor Chris Borgoins, he's the one who, person who, uh, who supplies my PhD on bridges, continuous bridges. And we actually solve a big design problem that bothered the expert engineers for nearly 40 years. And we came up with a theoretical solution to that problem. And engineer Robert Benham of Robert Benham Associates, he has written a book. He's a very uh, experienced engineer who, has, uh, who was almost on, uh, who, who ran his Robert Benham and Associates company. And engineer Dandanarayana is a very experienced uh, uh, construction engineer. And he, has, he was involved, heavily involved in uh, Southern Expressway, Matana Matala, uh, Outer Circle Expressway. Now he is uh, about 75 years of age and now he's uh, not heavily involved, is it? Uh, uh, he's, he's now involved in light rail transit. Right? And then engineer Nima Chandusiri, He's, he's a very good design engineer, big design engineer. And uh, he was heavily involved in uh, Central Expressway Part 1 with uh, Malit's company. And engineer uh, Mangala Silla, you know, he, he's, he's, he's an expert on, not only an engineer, structural engineer, he, he knows how to draft as well. So he helped us with the, all the draw, production of all the drawings for Orugodo at the flyover and uh, engineer Roita Swarna uh, and many other engineers of Road Development Authority Design Office. Uh, they approved this uh, Orugodo at the flyover design and uh, contract of Orugodo at the flyover because uh, the, why we got involved from Moroto University was uh, the contractor came up with the value engineering solution. So we did all the designs for the value engineering. And Maga Engineering and Chinese contract of Horogodota Flyo. And finally, not, not least, Civil Engineering Sectional Committee of IESL for providing the opportunity. Okay, thank you. And if you want, you can have a question time. Before uh, Engineer Malik comes, you want to ask any question that you like to ask? Or otherwise, we can go ahead with Malik. Yeah? Right. No questions. I have a question. Yeah, okay. But I think now time to adjust the computer. Yes. Okay, Malik. Now you have to look at this particular picture, yeah. right? When you are talking. Yeah. And also, uh, before I conclude, uh, if you want to get some idea about Europol based uh, designs, uh, second edition of the book by Hurst can be useful. Thank you first, uh, sir, for you, you invite me for this uh, presentation. Actually, that Professor Jai Singh, uh, not only uh, he was the inviting us, but he gave us confidence of doing any type of structures like this. I thank you, sir, for that also. First, actually, uh, we used uh, British uh, Euro codes for designing this. I will go for this section. Why uh, that I will do some case study about one uh, that uh, box uh, flyover we did uh, at Orugoda. Actually, this project has three flyovers combined together. 
to uh, uh, have some uh, chili pot to the to uh, that uh, port city premises uh, to fly to actually uh, this side that uh, in in, in uh, countryside uh, towards uh, Nugego side. Uh, that actually the geometry we uh, put 40 meter spans to uh, suit that uh, arrangement of uh, other roads and the rail railway. Then uh, uh, structure actually we uh, there are a lot of restrictions there. One is the height to get that uh, geometry we need to restrict our maximum of our superstructure to 1200. Then. Uh, span is uh, 40 meters. Then there is some other restriction for transporting of bridge girders. If we do uh, long bridge girders, it is difficult to transport the premises. Therefore, actually, we use uh, five, meet, uh, five segments and uh, eight meter segments and join together at the side. We cast that segment at uh, somewhere uh, fairly good, uh, that casting yard of Maga Engineering. Actually, Maga Engineering is the contract that is there. After casting that, they transport to the side, and at the side they connect all uh, five segment of girders and then launch at the side. Then actually, uh, to uh, before the design, we have to finalize many things. Uh, one is the uh, what the, what is the method they are, they are going to use for the launching. Uh, they suggest the travel erection girder uh, uh, and rear feeding. Actually, we have to design for this. Uh, uh, that launching stage. Actually, uh, launching stage was the most critical stage of the structure. If structure is okay for launching, then it like tested for other old loads. Uh, then uh, our structure was continuous for uh, live loads. Actually, the launching stage, it is simply supported. Uh, but uh, after launching, uh, we have to do some of tensioning at this, uh, over the piers uh, or the supports, then uh, finally end up with the continuous structure. This structure is continuous only for uh, live load because actually we are not supporting after the after launching, then uh, all dead load deformations are, uh, uh, happen before uh, um, before we doing that post or post tensioning. We are for that post tensioning, post tensioning only contribute to the uh, to the live load of the structure. Then uh, those are the construction stages. Our first construction stage is uh, connecting segments. Actually, casting segment is not uh, structural impact uh, that much. Uh, then uh, that connecting uh, pre-cast segment is the uh, construction stage. It happened at the side. We uh, tension that bottom uh, and that uh, web, uh, uh, they, uh, for attendance at the site. Uh, then second construction stage is uh, we have to travel girder on girder as we have shown in that uh, this uh, sketch that actually one girder should travel uh, on top of other two girder while uh, they are being rear, rear feeding. Then uh, second, uh, third construction stage is the launching. This is the most critical construction stage. Uh, at one step of this launching method, that the entire uh, launching girders, girder load uh, has to transfer to the beam. Uh, when that launcher moves from one uh, one span to other span, uh, that the entire uh, the launching girder load comes to the um, to the, uh, one one span, one uh, beam. Uh, that is the most uh, critical construction stage of the system. Then that uh, fifth one is uh, a long-term service stage after all losses and application of uh, load model uh, three, uh, three, uh, one, and, uh, one and three combination. Then uh, actually we use uh, MIDAS uh, for, uh, for modeling uh, for this. Actually there are a uh, lot of benefits uh, using MIDAS actually then by hand calculations we can't do hundreds of uh, combinations uh, of that uh, in load model one and load model three and as well as load model one to find out the critical uh, combination where that uh, the maximum loads comes uh, to the uh, girder. 
actually that uh, uh, that combination the, he actually had that uh, that uh, it just that uh, design outputs I have shown the maximum load arrangement uh, for mid span section. Upper one is LM1 and uh, lower one is LM1 and LM3 combination. Uh, this is the that uh, uh, that loads we have used as uh, explain from Jason explain. Uh, this is the load model one and this is the load model uh, three. We used uh, 1,200 kilonewton of uh, abnormal vehicle as specified uh, by RTA. Uh, this is the combination of load model uh, one and three as we are doing ES code. Um, this is stresses actually as uh, we are doing uh, uh, segmental cast actually five segments uh, uh, finally uh, combined together to form uh, one beam. Uh, we have, we can't allow any tension for at that uh, connections of that segments. Therefore, that all uh, entire segment is in compression at this uh, stage and the uh, launching stage. Uh, we can't find any tension uh, because of actually that last something like no crack situation. This is uh, stress distribution uh, uh, at transfer stage. Uh, actually, this is why we are have to go for higher stay, higher grade concrete. Actually, we are getting transfer stresses uh, about uh, almost 30, uh, 30 kilo newton, newton per millimeter squared. Then uh, for that, actually, uh, we have to do the strength uh, uh, about grade 65. Then this is a temperature action, actual temperature also we modeled. We did all the modeling uh, calculation by manual also to double check, but uh, uh, that software also gave us uh, that similar output. This is the temperature action uh, output from the software. Uh, this is now actually how it is happening. Uh, that uh, first you can see that uh, duct arrangement. Actually, our uh, structure is uh, somewhat uh, heavily pre-stressed. That uh, pre-compression is uh, somewhat higher, higher uh, because of uh, to have that uh, slim section about 1,200. Actually, uh, we can find some reference from uh, American codes uh, that ACI codes. Uh, for that span to depth ratio of uh, uh, box girder, actually they, what they recommend is little higher than what we have used. We have used more shallow, uh, more, more, more thinner superstructure. Uh, because of that, actually we have to use more higher peak compression. Uh, with that uh, high strength concrete, that is also possible. Uh, this is actually segment we have casted. Uh, then you can see now actually we are launching now uh, out of three bridges, uh, almost two bridges launching are now completed. This is the uh, um, launching stage actually. This is how we have um, taken uh, that launching stage loads actually that transfer to beam, the most critical arrangement of launching. Uh, no, this is not the most critical arrangement. This is one, one loading arrangement of launching, launching stage, but critical arrangement is uh, once that launcher travel from one span to other. Yes. Here I discuss a little about uh, uh, about zero faults uh, comparative to other faults actually. Uh, that the sections, uh, actually we have used that third category. This is actually a reference to the exposure conditions, but uh, we, are, uh, we have done that uh, no, no crack uh, situation design. Actually, this is uh, 
practice calculation as we know that actually you, you know about giving more freedom to engineer to decide uh, uh, that uh, about um, some factors actually the one like the minimum reinforcement actually that track control if you are using track control is still that minimum uh, reinforcement uh, that uh, minimum uh, steel provided we can decide actually whether we are using that uh, for crack control that uh, uh, this is uh, uh, that we have to first uh, we have to provide sufficient steel to transfer uh, that uh, crack uh, by uh, taken by uh, concrete while uh, uh, suddenly actually when it is cracking it has to transfer to steel that we have to provide enough steel to uh, get that tension. This is the minimum uh, minimum requirement of uh, track control steel. Then we have to use uh, about you know what actually two methods are there. One is uh, more empirical method. We have uh, they have given tables and we can select uh, we can select uh, reinforcement accordingly and spacing and reinforcement. Then second method is calculating actually actual practice uh, this method uh, actually we, this project we used uh, we calculate actual practice finally but uh, as i uh, suggest actually then we have designed for no crack situation Is actually that cooling uh, and creep and shrink rate actions also. Uh, this is software output of that uh, bridge. You can show more details uh, if necessary for uh, necessary that uh, how we did it in Midas and uh, that model and other details. Uh, shall we do it at question time? Then, yeah. Shall I just brief how we did the design of this? Uh, then I think better to answer the questions if any question is there. Uh, Yeah, chat box. Ah, maybe some questions in chat box. Ah, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. 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 I think first one is for you, sir. So basically, uh, new new Canal bridge. I'm. I think they are talking about this uh, six lane bridge. So the six lane bridge uh, is a Japanese funded project, and they probably they would have gone for BS ports. Uh, whereas uh, Rajagiriya Fio is a steel composite structure and it's a European design. So that's why it's a, and uh, even these other data structures, they are all B as the uh, European Euro, Euro code because there was a transition period. The last two, three, three years, uh, RD is now not accepting any bridge design for BS. They're accepting only Euro. So that's one question. Yeah, yeah. Let's see. Right. What is that? Uh, no, actually, pre stress concrete was invented by uh, Manuel. And that's why we call Magnal diagram, right? Manuel is a Belgian engineer, Belgium. 
and his name is pronounced as Magnal with other dots and other things. So uh, when it came to uh, English speaking world, it, it became Magnal, right? So we call it Magnal diagram. And then uh, from Manuel Fresenat is a French engineer, picked it up. And the first Priestess concrete structure was in uh, 1930s, but not for bridge. The first bridge was 1939. And by 1950, mid-50s only, they went for uh, bigger bridges. So it took about 15 years for Priestess concrete to pick up. And after 1950s, uh, by that time, uh, the, there was a recovery from the Second World War. And then pre-stress concrete became a popular material for bridges uh, after mid-1950s. So that is the history. But uh, 1930, they had, uh, they had some constructions, in, uh, not in England, but in Europe. The second question, uh, why the new, right, so I think uh, that is taken. I have to... Some modification shall be used to a four road from Columbia Langoda. Yes. Ah, yes. yes. Mandu, can you can you help me to get this uh, enlarged? I will download it. It's still download. Any, any other questions from the audience? Uh, this, this is the last item. Which one? A4? Open will have you. Ah, yes, sir. That time. Oh. Uh, right. What is this bridge? In fact, it's proposing it. Yeah. Ah, to, to, to twin deck bridges. Twin deck. Anyway, what I would like to say is when you use a software like CSI bridge or uh, Midas Civil, the options are unlimited you can, because you know what we need is a tool to analyze. The moment you have a tool to analyze, we know the stresses. When you know the stresses, always we can undertake design. And if even if it's a continuous structure, I have shown you how to do, do the design in the lecture series. right? So basically, uh, if you have any, any new idea or any specific uh, ideas come to Department of Civil Engineering University of Morocco. We are ready to start any kind of new work because uh, we have a lot of software and the capacity, and uh, we can certainly uh, do joint work. So it's an open invitation. And then, uh, any questions from the audience here? There's another question. So basically, I mean, uh, we, we can, if this engineer can actually come tomorrow to a one day and we can have a chat on this his new idea. Certainly. Huh? Ah, thanks for the invitation, right? Okay, you are most welcome to come. Right. There's another question. Uh, can you read the question, Mandu? You can see the question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay, right, right. So basically, the situation is uh, with the adoption of Eurocodes, 
the engineer has been given a lot of freedom and because a lot of freedom is with us and also because we have advanced uh, software for analysis, any level of analysis. And also we have the deep knowledge on uh, concrete technology to produce any strength in Sri Lanka. So I'm sure, you know, uh, we can uh, undertake innovative designs uh, while minimizing the cost. For example, uh, even the six lane uh, New Kalani Bridge, I mean, uh, you know, designing that type of structure as a continuous one is uh, practically possible because I have shown a spreadsheet during the lecture series. A, a simple spreadsheet like that can be used for a very advanced preliminary design. So once you know the section and the pre-stress, then after that, it's a detailed calculation. And the, the software are very good in doing detailed calculations. Because once you have the solution, once you have data, once you feed the data, the software can do all the detailed calculations because some of these are repetitive calculations that we don't feel like spending time, whereas for the software, it's not a problem. So, so even in India, about 80 to 90% of the bridges, because you know, India has a huge uh, expressway program at the moment, 80 to 90% of the designs are by MIDA civil. And the engineers say it's very easy to do repetitive detailed calculations using MIDA civil, because once you set up all the data from a good preliminary design, these uh, software are very good in doing repetitive calculations. So that's the position, right? And uh, that is the experience of Malik as well, because he has used MIDA civil, right? He has expertise in using MIDA civil. Uh, so basically, I mean, uh, uh, it's, it's a good software and also graphics are very good. Uh, the re reports are very good. And uh, whatever the software is, you know, to ensure that the approving authority is happy. But for us to be happy, what we need is a good preliminary design. Right? If you have a good preliminary design, and if you look at uh, what uh, Robert Benham said, and also you have a good idea that, you know, we are using more than double the loads that will actually come, then nothing can go wrong. If you can, if you have the capacity to check the preliminary situation and come up with uh, with reasonable allocations for unforeseen effects like long-term creep, shrinkage, induced stressors, thermal stressors, all those you can make a small allocation on the stressors. And the moment you do make some allocation, and I have shown you how to do the allocation on the stressors when you do a uh, continuous bridge, when uh, when we want to design for no tension, we allow a compression of one Newton per millimeter square. So, so what you, you can go up to zero, but we say we are stopping at one. So you have allowance of one to look after the unforeseen effects. So when you are doing the preliminary designs, we do, if the allowable stress is 30, we might use 28 or 27. So automatically we have built in allowance for unforeseen effects. That would be taken into account at the detailed design stage. So doing some tricks like that, you can come up with economical, but uh, advanced preliminary designs, right? So that's the way you have to look at it. Okay. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, you asked that question, right? Okay. So the question is, uh, can I, can you just do this so that I can? Right. Okay. So uh, the, there's a question one senior engineer has raised: Why not go for steel bridges rather than using concrete bridges? So uh, if you look at the historical development of bridges, initially it was all out of wood for steam engines, right? 
but steam engines were lighter, but uh, fire was a problem because you drop charcoal and bridge burns. Then they went for wrought iron. With the wrought iron, they had the expansion contraction problem, so wrought iron bridges had to be simply supported and mounted on rollers. So to allow for expansion and contraction. Then people thought, okay, why not use concrete? And for concrete also, they adopted expansion joints. But uh, actually concrete is a material that can take compression very well. But steel is very weak in carrying compression because it buckles. Because we use optimized sections. Those optimized sections are very weak in buckling. Compression, they are very weak because they can buckle. Whereas concrete is very strong in compression and they don't buckle. But uh, they missed the, the actual point and uh, you know, we started using uh, expansion joints in concrete bridges as well. And what happened? In uh, core countries, they use DIC soles and all the DIC soles leak through the expansion joint and it, 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 it creates chloride attacks on concrete. Then they thought, okay, now these aren't going to work. Now let's make them all continuous. Then they went for, pre, even for with precast beams, you make it continuous. So, so the, so the DIC salt attacks can be minimized. But if you look at Sri Lanka, we are not using DIC salt, so we don't have a chloride attack unless we do a bridge on the coastal zone where there can be some, some degree of chloride ingression. So, so the, for chloride ingression, the best solution is fly ash. The moment you use fly ash, about 15%, replacing cement, 15% of cement by fly ash, the chloride attack, chances for chloride attack is minimized. So there's no way you can have chloride attack, especially when you go for dense concrete. And with fly ash, we can go for dense concrete because fly ash improves the workability. And we have, high grades admixtures that allow us to go for very high, very strong concrete. But when you look at the ingredients in uh, pre-stress concrete, uh, our steel, con cement is manufactured in Sri Lanka. Sand is manufactured sand that we crush the stones and manufacture the sand. Then when you look at the aggregates, it's all from Sri Lanka. So only material that we import is steel. So concrete bridge is the best solution for Sri Lanka because we, we have some of the best quality aggregates you can find in this world. And we can make cement close to 52.5 grade because most of the cements that we manufacture in Sri Lanka by INC, they go for 52.5 grade, but they, they sell it as 42.5, right? Because they want to make sure they manufacture a good cement. So they go to the maximum of what is allowed for 42.5. So our cements are good. And then our, we can now, we have plenty of uh, plants for crushing the rock and manufacturing sand. So we can go for manufactured sand because manufactured sand has very finely ground uh, quarry dust as well. And uh, when, when you crush our aggregates fine, uh, they can be a posselinic reaction and you end up with higher strengths, right? So that advantage is also there. So only mat material that we have to import is the chemicals that we use to make admixtures plus a little amount of steel. So definitely, uh, and also we know with uh, being an island, we have a corrosive environment within the two to three kilometers of coastal zone. It's all corrosive environment, so it's not good to go for steel. Unless, even with heavy galvanizing, you can look at all the railway bridges, they are suffered. You know, even the new railway bridges that we have replaced, earlier we used to have a thick layer of bitumen. So our bridges were not a big problem, but these days we don't, we rely on galvanizing, but it doesn't work very well in Sri Lanka because we have the sea right around us. So, so concrete might be a better solution even for railway bridges. So that's the situation because Eurocode allow us to go for very high quality railway bridges with, uh, with uh, concrete.
Hmm. Now, actually, uh, this is how it happens. Eurocode code allows us to go for high-strength material. But if you look at concrete, what is the cost difference between uh, 40 megapascal concrete and 60 megapascal concrete? Very little, because it's only a little bit of cement, but our how we move from 40 to 60 is not by increasing cement. How we move from 40 to 60 is by adding fly ash to get workability and a long-term strength gain, plus reducing the quantity of water by using a uh, super, super strong plasticizer, what we call high-grade plasticizers. So, what we, so if you look at the cost difference, between one meter cube, completing one meter cube of 40 megapascal concrete can be 40,000 rupees. And completing one meter cube of 60 megapascal concrete can be 43 to 44,000 rupees. So you can see it's a minor difference, but you are double, nearly increasing the strength by 50%. The extra cost is 5%. So that's how you have to look at the equation. So the moment you look at it in that context, you can see there's a you know a huge room for uh, cost effectiveness with Eurocodes. Yeah. Yes, actually the problem with uh, BS code is uh, it generally allows up to about 50 megapascal concrete. Whereas Eurocode allows us to go up to 105. Whereas the, if you look at the cost difference between 50 megapascal concrete and 100 megapascal concrete, Again, the same equation comes only about less than 10% increase, but where you, whereas you double the strength. But uh, you can't gain this maximum effect out of reinforced concrete. Because in reinforced concrete structures, about 70% of the structure is cracked. And we ignore that in the design. So if you want to gain the if benefit of Euro code, you must go for pre stress concrete, pre casting, pre stress. It can be even post tension or pre tension, it doesn't matter, but it has to be pre stressed. The moment you go for pre stressed concrete, we can get a huge benefit from uh, Eurocode. So, the future for Sri Lanka is you know, going for Eurocode based pre stress members in pre stress precast members in buildings and bridges. That is the future. No, actually, uh, actually, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it comes this way. Now, let's say we have a batching plant at Cudwell. Now, even that batching plant uses manufactured sand. So they don't have reverse sand. Reverse sand is about one and a half times more expensive than manufactured sand. They have to first bring the cement to Cudwell. Because Cudwell is not available at Cudwell. Then aggregate also should be brought to Cudwell. Then we put everything into a truck mixer. Truck mixer gives only about two kilometers per kilo uh, liter. Now it uh, all comes. So we keep a time lag of four, four, four hours to maintain the sample of four hours. We have to double the admixture. The normal admixture, you have to use double dose. And then only you can maintain the, maintain the workability. After four hours, because we had to allow four hours to consider a traffic situation. So by the time we actually use concrete, we have now we have paid a, we, we, we are paying a lot unnecessary. Why not bring it directly to the site and go for uh, convert all, all the way batching quantities to volume batching and use admixture at the site by mixing it with water. And you can get high quality concrete at site as well by using site mixing if you have a proper mixer. So what you need is a small mixer, but it is large enough to do a good, good quality work. And there are small mixers with way batching as well. If we, if even if way batching is not available, our aggregate uh, consistent. So density is bulk density and is consistent. So we can actually convert the way batch into uh, uh, volume batching by making different batching boxes. So cement for cement, you have one box of one size. For aggregates, you have different size boxes. So by, it's all based on the bulk density. 
So you can convert way, way to way batching, way batching mix to where you do the mixing with volume batching. But we use admixtures because we are we don't need this time lag. The aggregate is uh, the effectiveness of that uh, admixture is maximum. When you are doing the mixing, immediately you place it so that we can drastically reduce the uh, water cement ratio. And you can get high strength concrete with uh, site mixing, provided we pay attention to detail. You have trained train the gangs, otherwise, you know, you can't just do it. But when I have done it, and I have achieved with 275 kilograms per meter cube concrete, 45 megapascal in 28 days, with 15% uh, fry ash set. So that's possible. But we, we, we trained the people and we told them that this is how it's going to happen. We are doing volume batching, but we need very accurate batching. You can, you can avoid retarders. And also, not only that, your super plasticizer, you can get the maximum effect of super plasticizer by adding only a little bit of it. So that, you know, the reason is you mix, use. There's no time lag. So even the super plus, well, the effect of super plus surprise is to disperse the cement particles. So you disperse the cement particles, get the maximum dispersion of cement particles and use it then and there. So the time lag is very minimum. And that way you can get very high quality concrete at site. But why we, uh, why we went for, actually, if you look at the scenario in Sri Lanka, we have copied a lot from Singapore practice or Australian practice and so on. But if you look at the labor rate and the material rate in these countries, in Australia, one labor hour is $50, 10,000 rupees, right? Whereas, in, so eight hours is 80,000 rupees, whereas we pay, we can get a good labor to work for 4,000 rupees a day. So the difference, is, so, so what we have done is we have copied from the things, from those countries, blindly adopted them here, right? So, so we have we have overlooked our actual ground situation and thought what is done in other countries is the best way to do it here. But if you look at the ground situation, it is in Sri Lanka, material is very expensive, labor is cheap. So our aim should be to minimize the material usage, not the labor usage. Right. Whereas in all the other countries, Western world, Australia, Singapore, their main aim is minimize the labor. Don't worry about the material. Okay. So our philosophy should be other way. Right? So that is why, uh, you know, now these days, uh, because of the crisis in the construction industry, we are working on minimizing the number of operations, minimizing the materials, and uh, now these days we are trying hard to bring the co cost of constructing one meter cube of one meter one square meter of a building to sixty thousand to eighty thousand rupees. But if you ask anybody these days, uh, majority will say twelve thousand to fifteen thousand. Uh, we are trying to hit half of that. So same for bridges. I have done a bridge three hundred feet long. 12, 10 feet wide at my younger day. And uh, the cost was, in 2012, the cost was 2,000 rupees per square foot. Or oh, 20,000 rupees per square meter. And those days, if you have asked any RDA engineer, they would have said the cost of a bridge should be around 150 to 200,000 rupees per meter square. And we have RDA, you know, design engineers from RDA, and that's the rate. But I did a bridge. It is actually constructed, you know, tractors full of uh, loads using the bridge, but it's mainly a pedestrian bridge, but we, we, we allow tractors as well, full of load, because there's a lot of construction uh, in, in, the, in the island. So we allow all the construction trucks to go, but uh, the cost was, was only 2,000 rupees per square foot or to 20,000 rupees per square meter, 2012. Whereas those days, uh, any RDA bridge was uh, 100, any 
generally the the equation is cost of a bridge is 10 to 20 times the cost of a building one square meter of building is 10000 rupees the one square meter of bridge should be 100000 to 150000 so it's 10 times 10 to 20 times 20 times that's correct isn't it yeah <laughs> yeah Ah, yes, that's true. Because uh, when you have anything longer, you have to undertake a specific traffic study and decide what the type of appropriate loading. Because when the, when the bridge is too long, like suspension bridges, you know, you have to consider specialized, special scenarios. You might have an accident. One side of the bridge is fully loaded, other lanes are not loaded. That's a city. So, so that's what, because of that reason, you know, it's true. You have to, you have to, if the spans are too long, but you know, the when you are using pre-stressed concrete, you will not get that kind of problems, right? So, but uh, it's true that you know, when the when the situation is very special, because every code has a limitation. And uh, in Europe, uh, what they say is uh, when you have suspension bridges or very cable straight bridges, you have to be careful when you are dealing with the loading situation because you have to analyze the traffic situation and come to a reasonable judgment. So BS loading also reduces and it comes to a minimum value when, the, when it's too long. It, it, it gives a value like that. Yeah, yeah that's, true. that's true. Only thing is, uh, you know, all those research is about 50 years old, right? But uh, now we are looking at the you know, Eurocode gives the latest research findings. So that's why, you know, we have to now stop using BS codes. And even for buildings. And we are, we are, we are, we are promoting ICTAD and NBRO to go for adopting the euro codes with the SLSI, but it's all happening slowly. So those uh, ISL members in the SLSI must uh, give a push and get it done. Yeah. No, 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 actually, yeah, but what, what we are using Indian lorries and uh, there's a maximum capacity for those ones. So, so they, no, actually, the maximum maximum weight of is a ten wheeler Ashok Leyland, and it will carry six hundred bags of cement. But anything carrying more will have more wheels, right? Like prime movers here, so they will have a lot of lot of axles. But the but the heaviest lorry having the minimum axles is ten wheelers having three axles, carrying uh, having a weight of forty tons. So that's the way you have to look at it. Even if you, because you know, overloading is not allowed in Sri Lanka because you know, uh, these, uh, you have to get the license. Say, say you have a Ashok Leyland tipper, the maximum is uh, four cubes. Right? So, they, you know, you have to get the license, otherwise, police will stop. You know, there's a maximum you can carry, like, uh, you know, normal Ashok Leyland tipper, uh, two axles. Can have only three, uh, three, three point two five cubes. That's how it take it goes. If you modify, police will stop. So in uh, so now loading is uh, strictly controlled. You can't have overloading easy. Yeah. Even this uh, other uh, Rajamaavata, they have uh, they they check the weight of the vehicle at Mahyanga. Is that right? Yes, they check the weight. So overloading is not allowed. So to, uh, generally, lorry drivers don't overload because overloading is uh, really stops when they find overloaded lorries. Only thing is, uh, only overloading situation is using container trucks to bring sand. So that's uh, overloading, but again, sand density is lower. So 1,500 kilograms per meter cube. So you can't get very severe overloading. Anyway, our roads are not flat roads. All the roads have uh, hills, 
So if you overload, the lorry can't complete the trip. So basically, I mean, our roads are not flat, right? Every road will have a few hills. So if the lorry is overloaded, the lorry will not complete the trip. So in that situation, so basically, probably in countries like India, where you have a lot of flat roads, you can get overloaded. But here it's very difficult to overload the lorry because you can't complete the trip. Yeah. No, no, actually, this is how it goes. Now, in temperature, when you get temperature, uh, can I get that book? Blue one, blue one. This is how it goes. So, top surface expands. It expands like this. In addition to that, it will expand this way. So if it is restrained, what will happen due to expansion? If it is steel, compression, it will develop compression, member will buckle. Concrete, no problem. Concrete will, or reinforced concrete will become precious concrete. Right? Because it's expanding, we are not allowing the expansion. So all the expansion will now taken by the concrete. So, uh, so rather than, you know, in concrete, reinforced concrete, we consider that structure. All the cracks will close because we are not allowing the expansion. So, no problem. Huh? Automatic twist, yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. Six, yeah. Huge, huge increase. Yeah. Yes. Yes. No, no, no. They, they did not increase the HP loading. What they did was uh, they increased. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Increase. No, only HA was increased. And, and the reason is when the spans are lower, only you get a huge one. When the span is less, very small, it's like WL squared. Right? So, so if the span is small, how even if you put a massive load, it, still the bending moments are small. Yeah. Yeah, that's right, that's right, yeah. Hmm. Yes, 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 yes. No, that, that's why, that's why, because, you know, this uh, 2006 loading may, looks like somebody panicked and increased, right? But now it is, uh, again, corrected by Europe. Eurogod uh, has corrected it, right? Yeah. Oh, you have not used it at all. All right. Eurogod. So then there's no difference. Yeah. All right. Yes. Yes, yes. No, no, no. Actually, if you are, if you consider 20, uh, 20, 25 meter range, there is no, there's no big difference between 2006 and 1978. There's no big difference. That big difference is for only for very small spans. So, the, in anyway, in a very small span, because it's W L squared, when L is very small, the change is very small. So basically, it's not a huge problem, but uh, in 2006 one, you know, up to 30 meters, 97.8 one had 30 limit. But whereas uh, it, uh, in the 2006 one, it increased. And if you look at, compare the 2006 loading, that is the highest loading in the world, right? But Americans have not adopted it. Germans have not adopted it. 
It's only the UK. Now they also have come down to the normal one. Yeah, RT, I think RT recommended it was a recent They Ah, yes, yes, yes. Ah, yeah, that's true. Box standards, you have a problem. Because they are small, you have a huge load. Yes, big problem. So, so 2006 is uh, not a, 2006 loading is not a good loading. Because that is the highest in the world, right? So, so now even in England, now they have corrected it. Yeah, now they are going with the European loading. I think I think uh, I think uh, section section one of uh, Central Highway was for uh, 2006 road. Yes. Yeah. 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 Section one and section two of Central Highway has been for 2006 loading, but uh, now it we you know now we now any future highway will be, for example. Uh, Ratnapura Highway will be for to Euro, Euro loads. Yeah, culverts would be affected because anything small was affected, not the big ones. 2006 and 1978 loading, only the small spans are affected, not the big spans. Big spans, it's a small like the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah all, all, yes, all small spans. That's true. That's true. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Then uh, can you conclude? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, to what extent we can rely on the uh, legal settlement? For example, if my CEO, you have experience, even as all change in the settlement files, as a huge impact on the reaction process. No, no, actually, uh, what, whenever you are dealing with settlement, settlement will not occur overnight. It occurs over a longer period. So you have to adjust the elastic modulus. So generally, elastic modulus becomes half. So, so the effect also becomes half. So if you have 10 millimeter settlement, we'll have a certain bending moment. But with that, you will get certain redistribution of moment as well. So settlement cannot be looked standalone. It, is, it will be involved, it will involve a certain amount of redistribution of moments, number one. The settlement uh, effect will, uh, will be only long-term effect, so people relieve the effect. So you should not uh, do a direct calculation for settlement. It has to be done very carefully because uh, there are creep is going to get rid of settlement effect. No, no. But the settlements, as told, actually, that the design for difference settlement is actually uh, in much practice that because it, it gives huge load. It will be no, no, actually, actually, the situation in Sri Lanka is if the if the because we have bedrock, our piles are resting on bedrock, they cannot be differential settlement. The differential settlement can come only with friction piles. If it is on bedrock, you can't have that easy differential settlement. Because it's it's on bedrock. So bedrock means no, only the elastic deformation will happen. So, but if you have friction piles resting on clay or sandy soils, you can get differential settlement. Not in Sri Lanka. So when you are in when you are doing highways, we always go to the bedrock and soccer one or two meters into the bedrock. So you can't get differential set. You do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes, you can allow, but even five millimeter will will have only a two millimeter effect. Yeah, five, five, yeah. Yes. So that will become a problem. Settlement is a problem only in continuous structures. If you are casting it simply supported, and even then you are making it continuous with uh, pre stressing or reinforced concrete, this differential settlement is not a major problem. 
because creep is going to relieve most of these effects they are occurring over a longer period creep means uh, when you when, when there are differential settlements uh, certain concrete will be subjected to compression and that will uh, that, then that concrete will shorten and uh, relieve the stresses so differential settlement is not a problem in sri lanka No, no, you can't. You can't because there are. Yeah. So it's similarly. Yeah, similarly in Sri Lanka, we we cannot have pile rafts because you know raft foundation and pile combined will work only on friction piles. If you have bin bearing piles, where's the settlement? Settlement is zero. When when there's zero element, can you mobilize the raft? No. So pile rafts will not work. But in Colombo, we have plenty of buildings with pile rafts. But those calculations are wrong because it's it's a pile foundation, it's not a raft foundation. Raft pile rafts will work only on friction piles. Friction piles combined with the raft will work, but not anything else. But uh, when uh, Engineers from other countries come and design structures here because they are used to friction piles. They include rafts in uh, buildings in Colombo as well, but uh, those will not work. So, so you have to understand the bottom line is in Sri Lanka, we have in bearing piles with deep socketing, and those have only a elastic shortening. So we cannot have. Differential settlements in properly constructed structures. So in the other countries, we use loads of central structures. We continue from the cemented with the beam slab. Actually, this is very infection. That with that moment, actually, we no. You can't have you can't have settlements in this. Yes, now it is which is having a problem if you don't have settlements happen. But but even then, in Sri Lanka scenario. Even for a continuous structure, definitely we are having a pile foundation with uh, two to three meter, two a minimum two meter socketing. You cannot have differentials. That is the bottom line. But uh, you know, when you get uh, consultants from other country, they insist on differentials. Well, they are not familiar with this kind of uh, bedrock situation because bedrock is available only in Australia, Sri Lanka, and India. Other countries, you can't get our type of bedrock. Yeah, yeah, that's true. They ask, they ask, but five millimeter may be okay because that is the elastic shortening. But all the all the members undergo five millimeter elastic shortening, then you have zero differential. No, I mean, the, if you if the consultant has properly ensured the construction of the board pile, which has two meters of any, how can you have a settlement? Can you, Mangal? You are experienced engineer. Can you have a settlement? No. No, no. In Sri Lanka, we never use friction pies. Friction pies have been used only in only in uh, southern highway up to Mathur. Right. Yes. No, no. Although you say it's a friction pile, if you have weathered rock, the moment you go into the fra fra fractured rock, again, if you do a maintained pile load test, you will find the, the settlement is only uh, only the elastic deformation. You don't get a settlement. If you have, if you just stop it in a normal loose soil, uh, you can get differential. But uh, bridge engineers don't do it generally. They go into some strong rock. It can be weathered. It can be fractured. It may not be proper genuine basement rock. But uh, for example, what is the tallest building in Sri Lanka? Altair. And is Altair on bedrock? No. It is on fractured rock. And we have the socketed. 10 meters into highly fractured rock, and we did the pile load test. Only the elastic shortening was there. Pile did not move a single millimeter. Why? 10 meters of 
socketing into fractured rock, highly fractured, because even if you go another 10 meters, still it's a fractured rock. Right? So the tallest building in Sri Lanka, which is much heavier than bridges that you are talking, has not fell a single millimeter. No, so, so, no, that, no that, that is the perception, perception and experience. So what I say is the logical thinking, if you have logical thinking, you can't have settlement. And if you suspect any kind of uh, differential settlement, what you have to do is do a test pile and do a maintain law test. The moment you do a maintain law test, you can see whether it's settling or not. If it's not settling, you can't have differential settlement. Right? Because we do a lot of designs based on the speculation. That is wrong. You have to do it based on the facts. So when you bring the facts in, you can't have pile rafts in Sri Lanka, you can't have settlements in Sri Lanka, because Sri Lanka has a special situation where bedrock is available all over the country within 10 to 30 meters. So that's a very special situation. No, you can't find you can find the similar situation only in India, only in Australia, no other country. Yeah. You go to Thailand, Middle East, three hundred meters, no bedrock. Yeah, this file termination criteria of ICTA document is also outdated. That has to be corrected. For example, ICTAD allows maximum 200 kilonewtons per meter squared skin friction in basement rock. But in basement rock, you can easily have 600 kilonewtons per meter squared, three times, under cells. So we are wasting. We are wasting a lot. So that is the situation. No, no, we don't have to because we can't we can't complete the structure at once. We are loading it in stages. So so elastic shortening is not a problem. Uh, actually, I covered this in great detail in the piling lecture. We did a piling lecture in the series, and a lot of information is covered in this class. But uh, the problem is, uh, you know, we get uh, consultants with of various different experience in other countries, and they seem without understanding the ground situation in Sri Lanka, they simply and of the and of the experience from other countries, so that's a problem. Okay, then uh, with that we can wind up. Hmm. No, actually, you have to make sure you adopt a stressing sequence. Where I got to be not bent. So you can do it on both ends, but you have to do it in a balanced manner. If you don't do it in a balanced manner, the I got will bend. Bend in the plan. You can't have the I got to back and bend in the elevation, but you can't have the I got to bending in the plan. But if you don't do the stressing operation carefully, I got to can bend in the plan. It shouldn't happen. But uh, whether you stress it in one end or both ends, that's all depend on the your your equipment. But you have to do the adjust the calculation, loss calculation according. Yes, yes, yes. So you have to basically eye girders will not be used for more than 30 meters anyway. 30, 40, maximum 40. Mm, yes, I got Even uh, uh, color debris is uh, 35 or 40. Is that right? 35. Color debris is merit law. We did a design for color debris, but later it was not adopted. We did a complete, I got a design for color debris. Complete design. We did a complete, uh, Mangal knows, right? Yes. Yeah. We did a complete design for color debris, but uh, later another design was adopted. Yeah, maybe they, yes, maybe the SDNCC got it wrong in the stressing operation or something. Those are the discard. <laughs> Later, Maga Engineering, SDNCC linked up with Maga and completed the pitch.
Uh, now we have come to the conclusion of this session, and I would like to uh, include uh, our chairman, civil engineer section committee, engineer Mrs. Kamala Gunawardena, uh, to deliver the presentation for our esteemed speakers. And uh, I would like to uh, request from all the participants, don't leave. Uh, we have some arrangements after the session as well. On behalf of the Civil Engineering Section Committee, uh, I, would, I would like to express our heartfelt gratitude to Professor Tisan Jai Singha and... Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, I would like to express our heartfelt gratitude to uh, Professor Tisan Jai Singha and Engineer Mali Mendis for the insightful session today. And uh, this is the last session of our uh, lecture series on structural design of highway bridges. So this has been a very successful lecture series. And we have received uh, many positive feedbacks from the members and participants. Uh, and they have gained a lot from this lecture series, uh, especially innovative approaches and cost-effective approaches and uh, understanding of deep theories. Uh, uh, explained by Professor Disanjay Singha. Thank you again, sir, for your commitment in conducting this lecture series. And not only in this year, last year also, Professor has uh, conducted a lecture series on structural design of highway uh, at all buildings. And it was also really successful. And uh, this year also, uh, together with Civil Union Section Committee, we, have, we are concluding the lecture series on structural design of highway bridges. So, and this has been actually a great service for the engineering community as well, because all the lectures done are recorded and has been uploaded to the uh, YouTube channel of ISL Media. So every, every, any, anybody can access at any time and can gain the knowledge. So most of the participants have uh, uh, praised that uh, uh, commitment done by user. And also uh, there has been a, a very, uh, really, uh, engagement from the participants together with the civil engineering section of the committee, ISL, for the past two years. So uh, I think Professor has set that trend. So because of that, they are uh, those participants are engaging with the other activities as well in ISL. So that is uh, another benefit that we have taken from this lecture series. Thank you again, Professor, for that. And again, uh, Thank you very much, Engineer Malik Mendis, for adding more value to the last session of our lecture series with your practical uh, knowledge and experience for sharing it. Thank you very much. And as the Civil Engineer Section Committee, uh, we have uh, conducted many technical events for this year. So that would not have been possible without the leadership, guidance, and confidence of the Chairman, Civil Engineer Section Committee, Engineer Mrs. Kamala Gunawardana. Thank you very much, Madam, for that. And also, uh, I'd like to thank uh, engineer Mangala Silva, who was behind all these uh, technical events and guiding. Thank you very much, uh, engineer Mangala Silva. And also, I would like to thank uh, Professor Chinta Singha and all the council members for your presence today. And uh, uh, last but not least, uh, I would like to thank all the participants who uh, engaged throughout the entire lecture series. Uh, with your insightful questions and engagement. Thank you very much.
and uh, you can uh, enjoy the dinner we have arranged at members lounge thank you very much again for the online participants as well <laughs>